Live from KSAT 12, the news at noon starts right now. And we are starting off with some sad late breaking news coming out of Nashville, Tennessee at this hour. A gunman is dead after a school shooting there this morning. Details are just coming in. Here's what we know so far. The fire department there in Nashville saying that they responded to an active aggressor at a private Christian school this morning. ABC reporting at least three dead. The fire department in Nashville saying on Twitter, multiple patients, not clear what condition they're in. ABC News doing what they can on the scene. Police say the shooter died after being engaged by officers. Not immediately clear whether the shooter died by suicide or was shot by police. Obviously an evolving situation. We're going to be staying with it on air and online. So stay with us as we become as we get more updates throughout the day. Meantime, here at home, still too close for comfort. That's how one neighbor is describing an ongoing problem at a southwest side street. San Antonio police have been called there a bunch of times for gunfire. And once again, they were called this morning. As Katrina Weber reports, people fear it's just a matter of time before someone gets hurt or even killed. It's a problem that is spelled out in black, white and yellow. Black and white patrol cars crowded into the 3100 block of West Gerald Avenue around 730 this morning after someone took aim at a home. Yellow evidence markers map out the shell casings, more than half a dozen in the middle of the street. San Antonio police say bullets also went into the home, which showed signs of being shot before. No one inside was injured but neighbors fear someone may be in the future. One neighbor told me off camera it's not uncommon to hear gunshots on the street and to even have bullets whizzing by. You can see from the stop sign where some of them landed. Police say this specific home has been targeted before. Their logs show they've had five calls for shootings or gunshots here just within the past month and a half. Police are still investigating why someone seems to be taking aim at it repeatedly. In the meantime, what has neighbors especially worried is that as those bullets fly, some of them might find their way into their homes. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police tell us a fight ended with a stabbing overnight. This was a scene just before 10 p.m. This is the 700 block of West Mally Boulevard, city south side near Commercial Avenue. Investigators tell us two adults were involved in the fight. One of them stabbed the other then took off. Right now, no arrests have been announced. That victim taken to the hospital. We are still waiting to learn his condition. Two human smuggling cases in South Texas in just two days. The latest one happening in Eagle Pass. 12 people found trapped inside this rail car. One of those migrants dead. The migrants found on Saturday afternoon when Eagle Pass Fire and Maverick County Sheriff's deputies were called to the Union Pacific train yard. They say that one of the migrants inside the rail car had called 911 for help, saying they were trapped for more than 24 hours. Three migrants taken to a nearby hospital, eight others detained by Border Patrol. This is the second migrant investigation involving a Union Pacific rail car. Just on Friday, 17 migrants were found near Canipa. Two were dead. Homeland Security investigators are looking into both cases. All right, let's take a live look out at the Alamo City. I got to say this weekend was nearly picture perfect out there. Ursula, did you make it out? Of course. It was who could pass this up. And now seems like it's a little chilly out there almost compared to yesterday. Uh, I'm glad you pointed that out. We had a little frontal boundary come through. We're watching this front closely. It's going to move back to the north a little bit today, which will still make it somewhat warm. The sun is out. You saw the picture there. But it's also going to help to generate some showers, I think, tonight into tomorrow. So this is all... Uh, things we'll be watching. You see the big picture here. We've got some cloud cover over South Texas, although a lot of that has gone away and the sun is out. There are a few showers uh, out to our west and then you notice some storms on the Gulf Coast. That is along that frontal boundary. A little closer look here around San Antonio. Still some cloud cover, but a lot more sun than we were seeing earlier. There were some showers for the morning commute. I think it'll be fairly quiet throughout the rest of today, but again tonight, and into tomorrow is when rain chances start to jump up a little bit. 72 right now. Dew point is at 56. We've got a northeasterly wind at around 10 miles per hour. Here's the KSAT 12 hour forecast. We'll call it partly to mostly cloudy. 80 degrees by 4 o'clock, 81 by 5 p.m. And then we start to add in those rain chances after 7 o'clock. Just a 20% chance, but as I said, those numbers probably go up some. Once we get to midnight, we bump it up to a 30% chance, and there could be some rain around for your Tuesday morning commute. We'll look at that forecast 
and talk about some cooler temperatures too. Coming up here in just a few minutes. Thank you, Justin. Looking ahead, the San Antonio Book Festival coming up in three weeks. So United Way SA will be accepting book donations from now until April 20th. San Antonio personalities, athletes, and community leaders all teaming up with the United Way of San Antonio and Bear County for this year's Read United. There will be a book drive also to help share the importance of literacy with other children in our community. Books can be purchased through the United Way's Amazon gift list, and you can find that list by scanning this QR code. All right, a gardening project ending with a Judson ISD student earning a grant that's going to impact her school for years to come. Tiffany Huerta sharing the inspirational story of how the school project turned into a lesson of perseverance and collaboration. Well, last year I was really invested in gardening and I decided with a couple of students that I wanted to start an environmental club. Carolina Mancilla, a junior at Judson Early College Academy, received a donation from a local business to start a garden at school. We weren't able to continue to support the plants because we didn't have the proper resources. But this was just the beginning of her gardening journey. In December, I met someone who could help me get compost for my school for free. With help from donations, her garden came to life. Right here is an asparagus. Mancia's passion for the environment also grew. She applied and was awarded a $5,000 Eco Scholars Grant. In my application, I did talk about how I wanted to have compost and be able to teach students about the importance of compost. The city of San Antonio's Solid Waste Management Department and Office of Sustainability Award Grant funds to projects that directly affect climate change, reduction of greenhouse gases, or other sustainability issues. The grant will be used to create a recycling program and a composting station right next to the garden. Mancia also wants to continue growing this garden and is seeking donations. I'm looking for more plants, maybe even a fence, because we do have a lot of deer on the campus. Mancia hopes her story inspires other students. If you really are passionate about something and you want to go for it, just go ahead and go for it because it could turn into something like this successful. Tiffany Huertas, Case at 12 News. From east to west, crews in San Antonio are busy blocking traffic. Yeah, they're making road repairs. Traffic Authority Stephen Cavasso is going to take a look at those projects that are causing the closures and how you can get around them. Go Spurs, go. It has been a tough trip for the San Antonio Spurs. Oh, a four on the road. We're going to explain what happened, who's looking great, and what comes next. Massive storms leveling communities in the south and leaving dozens dead. Now survivors are starting the cleanup process, how they're working to rebuild from the ground up. It's really hard to look at communities flattened, but now coping from that devastating tornado that sliced all the way through the south. Since Friday, there have been more than two dozen tornadoes in five states. ABC's Morgan Norwood is on the ground with some incredible stories of survival as the communities begin the difficulty of cleaning up. Rolling Fork, Mississippi in ruins among several towns in the south, beginning the long and uncertain road to recovery after monster tornadoes tore through the region. An Armory Mississippi school surveillance video capturing the moment a tornado ripped through the hallways. Debris dropping from the ceiling. Residents nearby scrambling to take cover. Once it started coming, it started shaking and I ran to my tub to get in my tub, but it felt like it was pulling me up. And in Georgia, trees plucked from the ground, debris everywhere after a series of twisters touched down Sunday. And while residents there begin the cleanup, folks in Rolling Fork don't even know where to start. The town minced by the EF4 tornado's 170 mile per hour winds. Irwin Macon miraculously survived only after a carpet shielded him from flying debris. And that carpet was over me and I just threw the carpet off. You see there's nothing. I don't know how I stayed here holding on to this floor. Tracy Harden tells me she herded her husband and seven others inside a cooler as the twister sliced through the restaurant. Our building doesn't have a roof on it anymore. So that's the moment we knew it was bad. This afternoon, we're learning more about the life's lost. At least two dozen killed in the Mississippi storms, including two year old Aubrey, who died in Silver City. It's so sad because like I'm just standing here and I can just see her at the door smiling. 
But amid all of this devastation and loss, the community coming together, rallying behind one another, dozens of relief organizations on the ground, with FEMA pledging to be here as long as it takes. I'm Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Really difficult to, to look at those pictures. Um, and, and here we are bragging about what a great, you know, weekend we had here. Um, we went outside and enjoyed it, and the folks there are really digging out. Those tornadoes were so massive, EF4 tornadoes, and the damage you see there, just homes taken right off of their foundation. And there could be some more severe weather in the southeast today. That's the unfortunate news there. As far as the aquifer is concerned for us, we're down four tenths of a foot to 635.7, still in bad shape. We need rain, we need it bad. Uh, the uh, pollen count, oak, highest it's been so far this season, 8,510. Molds are moderate at 640. Pine and Pecan are both there. Will we get any rain? We'll take a look at our chances coming up. Welcome back. Happy Monday. Happy weekend. It was gorgeous out there. Yeah, it was. Um, I felt a little guilty that we didn't get much rain, though. Um, and that 10% tonight's not all that great. Well, rain chances are actually going to kick up, kick up a little bit tonight or so. So there's some good news here. And I think going into tomorrow, we'll have some chances too. You know, this is a time of year where we get fronts, but what we need from those fronts is for them to generate some rain. Uh, we haven't been so lucky in that department, but I think with the front uh, later tonight, again, there, there is an opportunity. Not everyone's going to get rainfall, but there is an opportunity there. I'll start with the radar because we do have a few light returns on there, but you got to go way out to Ozona and really Valverde County before you run into any rain. Uh, we're not certainly not seeing any here, but you see some of those showers out there. Uh, perhaps a sign of things to come as uh, we get a little more instability working in the South Texas later today. 72 right now. Skies have cleared some. Dew point is at 56 and we're still looking at a northeasterly wind around 10 miles per hour. An indication that that front that we've been talking about all morning still kind of draped over us. Uh, cooler stuff to the north, warmer stuff to the south. That's what happens when you get these fronts. They make for big temperature variations. We've got 81 in Carrizo Springs, 82 in Cotulli. You compare that to 69 in New Braunfels and 66 right now in Austin. Uh, there is quite a bit of cloud cover down to our south, but here around San Antonio, skies have cleared, at least for the time being. We're in the low 70s here, 72 in San Antonio at the airport, 73 Port SA, 68 still over there at Randolph. And big question today will be how warm do we get? This front is forecast to move back to the north a little bit, which would allow some warmer air to shove in briefly. Uh, but right now we're shooting for a low 80s, 80 degrees by four or five o'clock. And then notice we start to add in some of those rain chances, 20% at seven o'clock, 20% at 8 p.m. And then we bring them up to a 30% chance as we get into tonight and overnight. Uh, here's a look at the dew points, and I think this kind of helps tell the story of exactly where this front sits. So the really humid stuff down to the south, and then the air dries out pretty significantly behind this front. So that, again, it's right about there, and then this snakes uh, out across the southeast where it's going to create some storms there as well. A lot of dry air across north Texas. Uh, and here's a look at the big picture. There's the clouds and the, those few showers that we see off to the west, quite a bit of cloud cover across deep south Texas. And then you run into the severe weather across parts of Alabama and Georgia this afternoon. Severe thunderstorm watch box in effect there, where it likely will be active uh, the rest of today along this front. Now that's where the greatest risk of severe weather is, but there is, believe it or not, a small risk uh, across East Texas and even parts of our area, Gonzales, LaGrange, Howitzville, Quirrell. I think that would be later tonight as this front again sinks uh, a little bit further south. We'll keep an eye on it. I don't think the severe weather threat is all that great, but by 10 p.m. There's our 30% chance of rain and we get some scattered showers behind the front. So we'll keep a 30% chance in there even towards the morning commute. This model shows a chance for some showers and maybe a couple storms even through the day tomorrow. We'll keep the 30% chance going. So grab the umbrella as you head out the door tomorrow just to be safe. Again, not everyone's going to get rain, but there is an opportunity there. And not only do we have the rain chances, but it's going to be windy. Wind gusts 35 to 40 miles per hour tomorrow behind this front. So be prepared for that, too. It's going to be sort of a blustery day with those winds out of the northeast. So our rain chance is probably highest tomorrow, 30% chance. But we do have some small chances Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the extended forecast 
Uh, you can see it there. We'll have it posted on the seven day forecast, but let's go back to the anchors. That's right. We've got a special report coming in now from ABC News. The police department response was swift. Officers entered the first story of the school, began clearing it. They heard shots coming from the second level. They immediately went to the gunfire. When the officers got to the second level, they saw a shooter, a female, who was firing. The officers engaged her. She was fatally shot by responding police officers. There was a five-member team who was on the, that was on the second floor at that time. Two individuals from that five-member team opened fire on the shooter. We know at this point that this shooter is a female. Uh, she appears to be in her teens, although her identification has not been confirmed at this juncture. We know that she was armed with at least two assault-type rifles and a handgun. We are efforting now to identify her. She entered the school through a side entrance and traversed her way from the first floor to the second floor, firing multiple shots. We now know that there are three students who were fatally wounded, as well as three adults inside the school. We are working to identify those victims, including the shooter. A total of seven persons were killed as a result of this morning's incident at the school. By 1027, the shooter was deceased. The officers had engaged the shooter by 1027 and she was deceased. Again, I said the first call came in at 1013 this morning. We'll have more details to give you later in the morning. Chief Drake will be here in a bit. Now Kendra Loney from Nashville Fire. Fire department crews are dispatched for active shooter incidents as well um, for medical support, but also for an RTF response, which is a rescue task force response to go in alongside of uh, MNPD response. Um, our crews were right there on the scene to provide medical aid to any survivors, um, but also be there uh, for victims so that we could try life-saving efforts um, in this case. So we went in as soon as it was safe for our responders to do so, to try to provide life-saving efforts for those that were impacted uh, by this incident and this tragedy. Um, our crews were able to be on scene to pull out those that had viable signs of life, um, those that were still showing uh, the option for to be saved. Um, and we did make transport of three uh, individuals, and three children, and then um, two adults that were taken from the scene. Um, our crews then set up a reunification unit. That reunification unit is at 2100 Woodmont Boulevard. That's where parents can go uh, to be reunited with their children. Uh, all of the remaining students were able to be escorted out of the building with faculty and staff. Um, we're not sure about the processes that they had in place, but we were on scene to help them mitigate anyone from seeing exactly uh, what else was going on, but we're sure that they heard the chaos that was surrounding this. Um, so we do have mental health specialists and professionals that are at that reunification site for both the students and the families that are going to be affected by this today. Uh, our OEM uh, units were able to provide buses to make transport from the Covenant School to the reunification site. We had one bus that carried 74 students and faculty staff members to the unification reunification site and an additional bus that had 34 students on them. So all of those persons were carried. Um, it was difficult for us to kind of identify who was just there as part of staff for the church versus who was there for uh, the school because it's all housed in one building. Um, but at this time, we were able to get that number of persons transported out of the building um, and into that reunification site. So that is where parents can go to be reunited with their students. There is a hotline being set up for parents to call, um, but right now that is where they should go, 2100. Woodmont Boulevard, which is Woodmont 
Pentagon Baptist Church. Um, additionally, we do have a debriefing site set up for on staff or personnel who are working this incident, um, and there are mental health professionals set up there for them as well. Um, there was one police officer that was injured with a, ha a hand injury um, as a result of making uh, an attack on this uh, incident. But other than that, that have been no additional um, injuries to first responders or personnel responding to this. And as uh, Don mentioned earlier, we will have further updates coming uh, later on in the afternoon. So on a typical day, there would be about 209 students inside the school and approximately 40 to 50 staff members, about 42 staff members. I'll take just a couple of questions uh, before Don, we go back. Be clear. So the seven dead and then nature of injuries, how many injured do you know? Maybe you're being treated still or injuries. I know the first responders were. An officer had uh, a wound from cut glass. That is the only other injury that I'm aware of. Do we know if the injuries of the students, are they critical or do we know the condition? The three students are deceased. The three students who were shot are deceased. Three staff members who were shot are deceased. Uh, that's a total of six victims. And then you have the shooter who was engaged by two of our police officers, part of a five-member team, and she is deceased for a total of seven individuals. There are no other gunshot victims, non-lethal, that I'm aware of at present. Do you know, do you know how many people were shot? Do you know how many people were shot before the police engaged the shooter? No. Did you know if they shot anyone after they engaged the shooter? Do you know if the shooter was able to shoot anyone else? Does the shooter have any connection to the school we know of? We do not know who she is at this juncture. We're trying to identify her. Uh, she does appear to be in her teens, uh, again with two assault-type rifles and at least one pistol. Do we know there's a lot of previous recent incidents that the police have come to the school or the church No, I'm not. Was there an SRO or an SSM working at the school? No, this is a church uh, that operates a private school. Uh, th there was no Metro Police personnel assigned to that building at any time. John, do you know if I have the two adults that were shot maybe confronted the gun? You said two? Yeah, the, the adults that were no, shot. No, there, there are a total of three adults. Three adults. Three yeah. adults who have been fatally wounded. Okay, one of them being the shooter? No. No, okay, so three total. So let me, let me go over this again. Okay. You have a total of six victims, three students who are deceased, and three adult staff members from the school who are deceased. The shooter herself makes seven. Do you know if one of the three adults maybe confronted her? I do not. Three the three teachers there is video from the school that we are viewing now to try to learn exactly how all of this happened. Can you say where the victims were located? Were they in the hallway, in the classroom? I cannot at this juncture. As you know, uh, five of the six were transported. So we will get that information later in the day. Did police engage with the shooter inside a classroom or in the hallway? Do we know the location? Uh, it is an upper level part of the school. It's kind of a lobby type area. It was not in uh, a classroom per se. All right, we'll be back shortly with more detail. We'll uh, tweet out, uh, give you a 15 minute or so notice before the next one, okay? Thanks. I'm just listening to Nashville police updating us on a school shooting that killed three students. There so there you have it. We are getting a lot of details very quickly coming in out of Nashville for that school shooting at the Covenant Presbyterian Church that's on Burton Hills Drive in Nashville. Sadly, we've learned that not only three young students were killed, but also three staff members of that church school. That's right. Right now they say the suspect, a female who appears to be in her teens, still working to figure out the identity exactly, saying that the first call 911 came in at 10:13. The shooter was down by 1027, and as Ursula said, three students, three adults, all shot and killed. Five of the six were transported. Sadly, they did not make it. Uh, police did go up to the second floor pretty quickly to uh, engage with that shooter, and apparently at that time we're not exactly sure what happened, but we do know the shooter was killed at that time. So altogether, we have seven dead 
at that Presbyterian school and an investigation now underway that young woman that suspected teenager was armed with two rifles, automatic, semi-automatic rifles, as well as a handgun of some sort. Uh, of course, we're working to get more information, but it appears that those seven people are the only ones, except, except for one adult uh, law enforcement officer who was cut by glass, to have received any kind of injury. Unfortunately, they were all fatal. And we do expect to stay on this throughout the rest of the day, so stay with us on air and online. But for right now, we're going to go to break. We'll see you in a few moments. wrapping up their four-game road trip. Remember, they didn't have Keldon Johnson, didn't have Jeremy Sohan. The Celtics, though, also missing one of their stars, Jason Tatum, out with a left hip contusion. So take a look. First quarter, former spur Derek White putting Boston up three with that bucket. A 9-0 Celtics run. Zach Collins, though, leading the Spurs with nine points in just the first quarter. Spurs up 32-30 after one second quarter. The man, the myth, the legend, Devin Vassell with the three ball. Spurs up eight. Yes, the Spurs up eight. Boston would end up outscoring San Antonio with 38-26 in the quarter. Jalen Brown, 26 points at halftime, but Zach Collins not too far behind. 18 for the Spurs. Boston led by 10 at the break. Third quarter, Trey Jones, Malachi Branham, the only Spurs making buckets after halftime. Each two in the first six minutes of action. Then Mamu coming right in for, oh, look at this, layup. Everyone just getting out of the way. Then gets fouled on the third drive to the basket. He had 11 after three Celtics, led by 19 going to the fourth quarter. That's when they really took off. Jalen Brown, oh, well, Jalen Brown would put the team really on his back. Here he is, you see, a little Euro step. They would lead by 47 points. Brown himself had a 41. Spurs lose all four games on the four-game road trip. Here is your final. Celtics 137, Spurs 93. San Antonio record now sitting at 19 and 56. So speaking of the standings, for the worst record in the NBA, 16 and 58. That is Detroit sitting in last place. Then Houston, San Antonio, and Charlotte. Remember, the three teams with the worst regular season records, they have an equal 14% chance of winning the draft lottery and the right to the number one pick. So what comes next? Spurs taking on the Jazz Wednesday, 7 p.m. here at home. Last game there this season. Then at the Warriors Friday and then in Sacramento on Sunday. A lot going on out there. Taking a live look at a Market Square. SA Live team put together another jam-packed show. We're going to check in with them in the next half hour. You're already paying more for rent and groceries. Well, you can add car insurance to the inflation pain too. Premiums are noticeably higher than they were last year. So 12 in your size Marilyn Moritz tells us how much one driver was able to save when they shopped around and bundled their insurance and some other ways you might be able to save too. That's at five.